And we, it's a long story of, of how I convinced him that I was the one. <laughs> it's a funny story. But anyway, uh, we started dating. And then when we got engaged, we were really seeking God, like, okay, what do you want us to do? Go to seminary? What do you want us to do with our life? And we met some people from Clemson Christian Fellowship, which was the great commission church in Clemson. Then, and just knew this is where we needed to be. And we got involved there. We had a couple that just discipled us and loved on us and just taught us so much. And then in 1984, we were chosen to be on the I-85 team, if any of y'all remember that, to go to Chapel Hill, North Carolina, to the University of North Carolina. So we went up there. We had one child, and I was pregnant with the second. And then the couple we went with, she had a baby shortly after we got there. So we got there and um, reached out on campus. We'd take our kids on campus, stroll them around, share the gospel, you know, have a lot of people in our home because that was what all we could do then. Uh, and so we got a group started there. Burke was named a pastor in 1988 when we moved over to Raleigh because there was another church in Raleigh. And so we just combined and started meeting at NC State. But this couple that would, had moved with us left. So at 27 years old, I was the older woman in the church. And that was really hard for me. I needed so much learning and so much discipling. And here I was supposed to disciple these girls. So it, this really compelled me to cry out to the Lord and just seek the Lord. So now I look back and go, man, that was really good. Um, in 1994, our church went through a huge split. Burke calls it a pruning. I call it a split because it was super hard. Went through a period of depression, read Job, just gleaned so much out of it. God spoke to me through Job. I haven't been spoken like that through Job's end of it. Um, but then we started having kids, obviously. So we had six boys in seven and a half years, started homeschooling, and there was always that tension. I know I need to be home, but I need to be out in the gospel. I need to be home, I need to be out in the gospel. So I have a feeling y'all probably feel that tension too. And that's something we're gonna talk about um, later on. After my youngest went to high school, because we put him in, that we sent him to public school for high school, um, I worked full time for a financial services company. But I would still go to campus at, in the afternoons, one or two afternoons a week to do a Bible study. Well, one Bible study was just getting started, and there were like five girls. So I said, you know, let's go around and introduce ourselves, tell us something about you, your family, yada, yada. Every single girl said, my parents are divorced, my mom, I don't like who she's living with, my dad's remarried, da, da, da. it was a, something along that story. And that's when God said, Barbara, you've got to get back on campus. These girls don't know how to live a godly life. Their example has just been destroyed. So, um, so I quit and joined the staff with our church. We're now empty nesters. It's wonderful when, it's wonderful to have the kids. It's wonderful to the, the thing. <laughs> And uh, first in my prayer all through our marriage was, we want to be Priscilla and Aquila. We just want to be that couple that's able to be together and share with others. So that's where we are now. And it's wonderful. So I've learned a lot of things along the way, probably things that some of you ladies have learned and you ladies at home are learning. So that's just what I want to share with you all today. Just some of the things that I've learned. And hopefully it'll just give you some encouragement. So let me pray and ask the Lord to really bless this time. God, we uh, do come before you, and I just thank you for each precious sister here who is giving up her time to uh, listen, and Lord, we ask your Holy Spirit to be present in such a great and mighty way, to lead us and teach us, and Lord, just speak to our hearts where they need to be spoken to. So with God, our marriage and our kid, our parenting. So hopefully this will touch on something that you guys will, will learn. So first, the relationship with God, we all know first and foremost, it has got to be first and foremost. And the hardest time for me to have that happen was when our kids were young and you were up in the middle of the night, one or once or twice or however, uh, it was just because being single and then being married with no kids, the pattern was you get up early, you have a quiet time and then you go start your day. Well, it didn't happen as being a mom with young kids. And one after our last one was born, I was just desperate. And I'm like, okay, God, I've got to fight for this time. 
I'm getting up at 5.30 in the morning. I'm going to have a quiet time. So I got up at 5.30. The house was quiet. I sat on the sofa. I opened my Bible. And no sooner than I opened it, than a door opened and little Peter Patter. And it was my youngest. And he was just standing at the top of the stairs. And I feel like, and I remember at that moment, God going, Barb, I'm giving you grace. Don't feel like you have to meet me at 5.30 in the morning. I give you a greater grace. And I understand this season in life. And I was just so thankful for that, not feeling that uh, that uh, need or just that, that hard, the law. I didn't feel the law that I had to be there at 5.30 in the morning. So that's what God really showed me. God knows our season and he just gives grace in each season. And I, I picture, I've told the young moms at our church this, I picture uh, life and singlehood and motherhood kind of like an hourglass. And you start out and it's just this big and you've got all this time and, you know, to work for the Lord and, and then you get married and your time for the Lord, you know, the first Corinthians seven says, now you're concerned about the things of the world, how to please your husband. So but I mean, you still have time to do the, the Lord's work. And then, but boy, it comes down to this. And this is motherhood. And this is young kids. And you're in this hourglass. And your time is not like this. And that's okay. And you may spend a lot of time there. But that's okay. God knows it. And he's pleased that you are there. And not fighting to be back up here. Or to be down here. Because that season's going to change and you're going to get a little bit more freedom and a little more freedom. And then you're going to be Lord willing, empty nesters and have this much freedom again, except it's going to be even sweeter because you've got a partner. So I just think God just don't feel the pressure. There is a tension. It's good that there's a tension of, I want to reach out and I want to be home with my kids, but God is giving you kids. These are your disciples. These are your disciples right here in this hourglass. Not, and we'll talk about it later of how to reach out when you're in this, this part. But be content because Satan, he is prowling around like a roaring lion, isn't he? And in each of stage of life, he is trying to get us. And that's such a big part is in this stage. Memorize God's word. Hide it in your heart. I know y'all know that. Do it with your kids. We have a memory madness program that we do at our church. And it just gets you... Kids are memorizing. You can memorize too. Hide God's word in your heart so much. And if you don't have kids yet or you're single, I don't know if anyone is, is listening that's single, man, this is your time to really hide God's word in your heart. We had a, um, in Clemson, we had a Bible study one morning. Several of us women would meet together and a couple of them were singles. And in Clemson, the biggest crime was that you, someone's got their clothes stolen out of the laundromat. So we just left our doors open and everything. Well, I walked in and this girl was sitting there with her Bible open and she just had her head down like this and she had fallen back asleep. But she read one verse that morning and she took, she told us later on that that verse just carried her through the day. So that the goal with our relationship with the Lord is not that we have to have quiet time, but that we renew our mind with God's word every day. And it doesn't have to be a 30 minute chunk. But boy, make sure your mind, however it works for you, is renewed. If it means lay a Bible out and just flip through verses in the kitchen, put verses up on the refrigerator, on your window, on your mirror, wherever it is, the goal is to renew your mind every single day. Um, but I do encourage to get extended time. Once a month, if you're able to, um, depending on your husband's schedule of how often he could come home, get that extra time. Um, that is so huge. The Lord just wants to shower you, shower you with his word and with his love. And if you memorized out of the old NASB, uh, New American Standard, way back when, Philemon 6 says, we understand all the good things you have in Christ when you share your faith. So that's another key, is sharing your faith. Because you know what? When you share what Christ has done for you and you share that with somebody else, boy, it just renews you, doesn't it? just gives you a new, a renewed perspective. And you can share the gospel every single day because you need to share it with yourself. The first time I heard that, it was like, oh, that's kind of, true. no, it's really true. We have got to remember that God gives grace. He rejoices over us. He forgives us. He longs to be gracious to us and works don't 
count on us getting to heaven because we could so easily go through the day with our list and check it off and we feel successful when we've gotten everything accomplished, but that doesn't do it. It's all of what Jesus has done for us. And we've got to remind ourselves of that. And remember, God even rewards you when you give a cup of water to a child. Sometimes you might want to throw that cup of water on the child. <laughs> we just give it to them. There's a reward in just giving the cup of water to the child. Um, if you get the Great Commission uh, uh, devotions every day, you've heard this story because it was in here recently. But I'm going to tell, tell it again because God taught me so much. After our fifth child was born, he was a week old, and we were going stir crazy. And I felt pretty good. So I loaded up all the boys and said, let's go to Saints Club. We can walk around. It's air conditioned. It'd be good. So the oldest, our, our seven-year-old, was in charge of, no, he was six at the time, was in charge of the baby in the stroller. And then I had the other three in the car. And we walked around and saw all this good stuff and everything. And we get up. We had bought a few things. We're in line to check out. And this man comes up and he taps me on the shoulder. And he goes, excuse me, ma'am, do you have a baby? And I went, Yes, he said, well, you left him back in the men's clothing. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, I thought this was such a successful trip. <laughs> and here I left my baby back here. Well, um, Isaiah 49, 16 says, can a mother forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Mm -hmm. Yes, she may forget. <laughs> but I will not forget you. I have inscribed you on the palm of my hand. And that verse has just stuck with me because I'm, I'm guilty. I have left my nursing child. But God will never forget us. And we are inscribed on the palms of his hand. And that verse has carried me so through. You know, the hard days, you know, the difficult days. I'll be honest, this morning we woke up and our, one of our sons had sent us a picture of a car smashed upside down in the middle of the road. And it was him. He had a car accident this morning. And totaled the car. He hydroplaned and totaled the car. And praise the Lord, he's fine. Everything's fine. His wife came and picked him up. Everything's fine. But that verse came to mind. Lord, you have been scratched him on the palms of your hands. You knew exactly what would happen. It's not your foot where you don't see it. It's not your, un, you know, here where you hardly look. It's on the palm of his hand where he is always looking. Um, another verse that really has encouraged me with my relationship with the Lord is John 10, 14, where Jesus is the good shepherd. And he says, I know my sheep and they know me. Are there times when you just feel like my husband doesn't understand me? My kids don't understand me. But Jesus always understands you. He knows you and he always understands you. And that's been very encouraging to me. So I wanted to open up to whatever verse that's encouraged you, but let's save that for the end. So if there's something that a verse that's really encouraged you that you feel like would encourage everyone else, just write it down now and we can share that at the end. All right, so let's move on to marriage, things that I've learned with our marriage. We will celebrate 40 years next month. So that's super exciting in two weeks. But you know what, when I was single, I thought, if I graduate college and don't have a boy or and I'm not engaged, then I'll never get married. I don't know where that thought came from. So um, because I thought marriage was the end all. Singlehood, it was all right. It was good. But man, marriage is just going to be awesome. So Burke and I got married right after college. I graduated from college and it was hard. It was not the end all. <laughs> Some of you maybe have it be thinking, man, our marriages are great. Well, ours was hard. We laugh. We're married 40 years. The last 25 have been great. The first 15 were really difficult. So, um, because, but the reason was, well, oh, so then after I got married, I thought, well, man, then when I have kids, that'll be the end all. This will be, then things will really be good. But if you have kids, you know it's not easy to have kids. What was the root of that? Discontentment. It was just discontentment. And that is something the Lord wants to root out of our heart is discontentment. Back in April, I was on a Zoom call with missionary wives from all over the world. I don't know how that happened. I don't know how it was able to be done, but it was amazing. And two things came out of that. One, 
we struggle with identity and contentment. And those and comparison, identity and comparison, which leads to discontentment. And what I realized coming out of that was um, in this day of social media, and we all know it, in this day of social media, we can so, Satan just gets us here. And I don't know if it's happened to you, but you see a family walking into church and they're all dressed, the girls are matching and they have, their hair looks beautiful and they just come in and they sit and everyone, the kids just sit and you look at them and go, man, she's got it all together. You barely made it out of the door. You look over, your little boy still has strawberry jam on his cheek because you missed wiping it out. But you don't know that that family argued all the way to church. All we do is we look at where they are now and we build this whole image around their life and compare ourselves to it and we come up short every time. Every time. And that's where Satan wants to get us, is in comparing comparing ourselves to others. You know what? We have an audience of one, our Lord Jesus Christ, and he's the one that we need to be per performing for, is the audience of one, not for anybody else. Um, what I did a little quick, and this kind of has to do with parenting, so we're going to kind of scoot into there, not for long, but just a little bit. I did a quick math equation. So my youngest, my oldest was born when I was 26 and my youngest left home when I was 52. So that's 26 years that I had my kids at home, Burke and I loving on them, training them, teaching them, and then sending them off. Now my mom is 88 in great health. Her mom lived to be 100. My grandmother lived to be 100. My grandmother's two sisters lived well into their 90s. So I take after my mom. It's a good chance that my mom's going to live into her 90s and that I will live into my 90s. So let's say God chooses, he tarries and chooses to bring me home at 92. So that's 40 years from when my youngest child left home to when I'm going to go be with the Lord. And you know what? That is my alarm. It'll um, it's in that back pocket that is facing outward. You can just pick it up and turn it off. Just dismiss it. Swipe the dismiss. Sorry. It must be 222. There we go. Um, so that's 40 years after my kids leave home that I have an opportunity to really invest in the kingdom of God. If I haven't invested well in my children, and I come out of there going, you need to follow Jesus. Let me help you. I'll share with you all that I know. And yet my kids are not following the Lord. Who's going to listen? Who's going to listen? This time of your kids being there is so important in investing in the kingdom in their lives because God has another season for you to do the same. And so we want to be faithful here because we know God, it's, if God's working you faithful here then we can be faithful lightning yeah. nice. does that make sense mm -hmm. okay so in our marriage though we have to keep our husband the most important above our kids and that is so hard when our kids are young because they're more needy i remember thinking well burke can tie his own shoe and he doesn't need <laughs> diaper change and he can make his own lunch so this is hard um I don't know if you've ever read Gary Thomas's Lifelong Love book. If you have it, it's the best marriage book we've found. And his just, one of the things that we've gotten out of it is, so often we think a good day is a day where we go to bed and our husband has served us. And it's been easy. And he's made it easier. And that's a good day. <laughs> but Gary Thomas says a good day is when you can put your head on the pillow and go, I served him. I served well, because the greatest among you is, your, is the servant. And so that's what needs to be our mindset is, how can we serve our husbands? How can well, we, yeah, in the midst of we know in my meeting, stage, I can't, uh, how can I help uh, you? What can I do for you today? And your kids see that he is the most important, that you're making time for him. One thing that really helped me, uh, or that really stuck out to me in the John 14, I mean, 10, 4, 10, 
John 10 chapter is Jesus says, I have the authority to lay down my life and I have the authority to take it up again. He never took it up again. He just laid it down. And that's the example that he calls us to follow. Lay down your life. So I want to hit on five things that um, Burke and I did this talk at Faith Walkers, how to keep a marriage hot, how to keep your marriage hot. And so we decided what we needed to do was we would both write down our thoughts and then compare. So we did, and um, they weren't the same. <laughs> so we decided it was going to be 10 things to keep your marriage hot. Five for the husband and five for the wife. So these are what I came up with because we all know and little ears might need to, at the end of this time, I'll let the moms know that little ears don't need to hear the last thing that I'm saying. Now we all know what it is and we know that the husband put that first. So for me, it was the last. So here is the first thing that I put uh, ways to keep your marriage hot. The heart, it's Proverbs 31, 11. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. Can your husband trust you? Can you keep a secret? Or do you go around as a tail bearer? Because that is huge. Is that he can trust you. He can trust that when something needs to be spoken, you're going to speak it in love. There are times we need to speak into our husband's life. Are we going to speak it with love? Can he trust us that when we need help, we'll ask for it? And we're not going to go, oh, I wish he would say that I need help right now. Are we going to ask for it? One of the, um, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Here, you can just bring it to me. Sorry about that. It'll probably go up again. Um, one of the husbands in our church told me, he said, you know, I will give my wife the moon. I just need to know she wants it. And that really spoke to me. Yeah, am I voicing to my husband in a respectful way what I want or am I expecting him to pick up on that? Because more than likely, God hasn't wired them to pick up on that. But we can certainly ask. And... Um, he needs, are we humble to receive? Are we humble to receive his input into our lives? Or do we put up a block? It is very hard when you go through the day and you're struggling with the kids and my three and four year old and 10 year old never didn't say, mom, you're just the best mom ever. I didn't hear that. I wanted my husband to tell me, but I didn't tell him that I wanted him to tell me. And so, of course, I was disappointed when he didn't tell me, but I didn't tell him that I wanted him to tell me. Does that make sense, how crazy that is? And so when he would say something that was spoke into my life, it was so easy to put up a barrier. Oh, one more thing I'm doing wrong, because it's very easy to go through the day thinking, well, I'm a horrible mom. Nothing, nothing's working. One more thing. I don't want to hear one more thing that I'm doing wrong. Well, that's not the heart of a husband that trusts him, that he can trust. He wants to trust that he can speak into our lives and we will receive it humbly. Uh, and that goes to Ephesians 4.25 about speaking the truth in love. And that should be our parameter in speaking, speaking the truth in love. All right, the second one is comes from Proverbs 31.12. And it says, she does him good and not harm all the days of her life. Do you pray for your husband daily and often throughout the day? That's a great thing to do, that you do him good as you pray for him. You may not be able to see him, but you certainly can pray for him. Do you speak well of him in public? When our kids were little, we lived in a neighborhood and there were other little kids. And so the moms would come out and we'd congregate because we needed to watch them. They would ride their big wheels on the street. And so we needed to watch the cars. And the other two moms were not believers. And so quickly did that conversation turn to husband bashing. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't do it. And I would try to just, I would always come back with something positive about her and even start the conversation, something positive. And slowly that conversation never came up again. Mm -hmm. 
because they knew I wasn't going to participate. Mm -hmm. So make sure that you don't husband bash, speak well of him, and don't joke about him. Now, sometimes we do want to joke around and our husbands can take it. You got to know your husband. He may not care. You know, Burkle, I don't mean demean in a, in a bad way, but he'll like laugh at himself and he'll speak about it in a sermon. So he doesn't mind that. We, don't, we laugh about each other, but know your man to know that when you joke about him, is it respectful? Is it doing him good and not harm? Be quick to compliment him in public. Um, Burke buys more clothes for me than I do. And one day he was sitting in the mall having lunch with a guy and he saw this woman walk by and she, he liked her outfit. So he went up to her and said, hey, where'd you get your outfit? I really like it. I want to buy it for my wife. So she told him and he did and he brought it home. And so I just, every time I wear it, I want to make sure I'm telling people, my husband bought this outfit oh, for me. Oh, Isn't that great? Um, so yeah, I appreciate that. Reprove in private, and you know this, especially not in front of the kids. That's a great way to do him good and not harm. And build him up in front of the kids. Let them know he, they've got the best dad ever. Of all the dads in the world, God gave them the best one. And what a huge job that is. Um, when we were getting the church started at Chapel Hill and in Raleigh, um, Burke worked a full-time job. So he would come home, he drove for UPS, he would come home, uh, grab a quick dinner, and we had it worked out that there were like three nights of the week, he would, he would just leave and go back, go out on kids. And so I was left to put the kids to bed many times. And I could sit there and go, I know your dad's gone again wish he'd stay home. Or I could say, your dad is out telling people about Jesus. And that's one of the most important things you can do. So it's a choice. It's a choice that you have to make to build your husband up in front of your children. Boy, keeping your marriage hot, build him up. It will go a long way. All right, the next one is from Ephesians 5.33. And it says, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Respect means deep admiration for and honor. Do you respect your husband? And that goes back to compliment him often, even for little things. You changed the light bulb. Thank you. That was awesome. I was so dark in this room. Little things. They don't go out in the world and beat down the bushes and get compliments either. So for it to come from us is huge. And that's where you need to know your man, what builds him up the most. Um, one thing that really helps is list 10 things you appreciate about him and just stick it in your Bible and look at it a lot. Tell him when he's doing something well or out of the ordinary, or just something ordinary. Buy him something for no special reason. Just because, just because you're such a great guy. I just wanna buy you something. And compliment his character. Y'all probably know that, how important it is for the kids, and it's so important for our husbands too, to compliment their character. A while back, Burke's office was in an office building a three-story office building and it had a cafe in the building so people could come and grab lunch and one day he was walking out the door the front door and this woman was walking out after him with her lunch in her styrofoam container and just as he opened the door and the woman walked out this big gust of wind came and it blew her styrofoam container and opened it up and it flipped right over on the sidewalk and her lunch went everywhere and Bert said oh my goodness I'm so sorry let me go buy you another lunch and he went in and he bought her another lunch now, I could have had the attitude of, well, you bought her lunch, you don't buy me lunch. <laughs> or be so thankful that he was a man of integrity that just wanted to show Christ to somebody. And so that was the, that was the path I chose. And just to look at the character behind the things that he does. And tell him you're proud of him. Boy, our kids need to know that. Our husbands need to know that so much. But you are just so proud of him. 
All right, that was three. Four comes from Titus 2, 4. It says, teach the younger women to love their husbands. And love means, this was a good definition, choose to be at your best when he's not at his best. Our husbands are going to get irritated. We're going to get irritated. Be at your best. Stay calm when he gets irritated. Don't let a harsh word of his stir up your anger. Be calm. Be at your best. Let him drop the ball and leave it there without your correction or nagging. Boy, don't we want to be ball picker uppers. If that's a job, we're probably pretty good at it. Ball picker uppers. Um, don't think you need to be the rescuer there. Let the ball drop. Because then you give him, giving him that freedom to fail gives God the freedom to come in and work on his heart. And you, we all know God can work on his heart a lot better than we can work on his heart. He's not going to be perfect. We're not perfect. So let God do the changing. And remember, you are his wife, not his mother. You don't need to be the corrector in his life. Be flexible for him. When I married Burke, this was his, he grew up in Columbia, South Carolina. His mother was the queen of the South. And her attitude was, I'm leaving the back door open. Anyone that wants to come in, come on in. All of my kids' friends can come in whenever. If I'm not there, that's fine. You can get whatever you want to eat out of the fridge. Just if it has a sign on it saying, don't eat, don't eat that, but anything else, just come on in. Burke would come home at five o'clock, say, hey, I invited George over for dinner. Great, that's great, have him come over. I grew up in a home where my mom worked and she's a very extreme introvert. And so to have someone over was you planned two weeks ahead of time and you cleaned the house thoroughly and she spent all day and it was very stressful cleaning and cooking and all that. And then it was such a relief when the people left. So that's what I grew up with. I married into sure, come on over whenever. So the first time Burke, this was shortly after we came back from the honeymoon and Burke said, yeah, I've invited so-and-so over for dinner. And it was like, what? I don't have time to cook. And he would tell me, Barbara, we have peanut butter and jelly. We have peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. It's not a big deal. So he has helped me learn to be hospitable and learn to be flexible, that it's not that big of a deal. Because I thought my reputation was on the line. I wanted to guard my reputation. And so I became more important than the people. And a meal became more important than the people. And things became more important than the people. And so he has helped me to adopt the phrase, nothing is more important in this house than the people in it. And I don't have to worry about the things or the meal, it's the people. And so be flexible, be flexible. Look nice for him. You don't have to look fancy, but look nice and know what he likes. We have a couple in our church and, and uh, she said, my husband really loves me to wear flannel to bed. And I was like, mm, boy, that's real different than my husband. <laughs> uh, but she did because he liked it. And so know what your husband likes. And dress that when he goes out in public, of all the women out in public, he is looking at this woman beside him going, she's the love of my life. And I'm so proud to introduce her to you. Look nice for him. Consider his wants and needs more important than yours. We all know that. Um, but I have a friend who she and her husband were having a kind of a rocky marriage. And I lost touch with her for a while. And then when we got back together, she was just telling how great their marriage was. And I said, well, what made the difference? And she said, I one anothered Greg. I went through the Bible and found all the one another verses. And instead of applying them to all these other friends and people, I applied them to my husband. And I one anothered my husband. And she said it made all the difference. So consider his wants and needs more important than your own one another, your husband. Okay, the next part is the last one is the one that little ears shouldn't hear. And we all know what it is. 
So um, 1 Corinthians 7, 3 through 4 says the husband should fulfill his wife's needs and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband. And the husband gives authority over his wife to over his body to his wife. You own his body. What a treasure. Consider that a treasure. Consider that a gift. You own his body. It is a gift. Sex is a gift. And uh, I think how uh, Burke and I have been on, we've talked to faith walkers. I don't even know how many faith walkers there have been, but we've talked to each of the faith walkers. We've gone on mission trips. We've had thousands of kids in the years we've been on campus come through our door and have had access to my husband. Our children, our grandchildren, they all have access to our husband. But I'm the only one that gets to be intimate. And that is a treasure. And that is something I cherish and I love. And I don't want that, that part of our marriage to ever be harmed or hindered because of my choice. So let your breath satisfy him at all times. Let him always be exhilarated with your love. It's a choice. And it's very hard when you're exhausted. And it's hard when you have babies and you're nursing. It's a choice, but it's a choice. But when your children grow up and leave home, that I always, I always liken it to like your, your whole life, your, your marriage, you're just building bricks and you're taking bricks and you're just putting them on top of each other. And then you got this wall of bricks and but someone can come knock it down. It's not hard to knock that wall down, but sex is the mortar that keeps those bricks in place. And every day or every year after year, you're building this wall. And it's stronger and stronger because you have that intimacy is there. Don't let it go. Don't let it go. Be creative. Um, Song, Song of Solomon 7.13 says, New delights as well as old, which I have saved for you, my mother. So take the initiative. Try new things. Dangle bait in the morning. Tell him there's going to be something waiting when he gets home or late at night. Text message him and get time away. Make the treasure that time. Get someone to keep your kids for the weekend. Get time away and flirt with him. He probably loves that. Just flirt with him. Have a good time with him. He's a gift and look at him as such. So even with when you get old, you can have a hot marriage. So that is the marriage, things I've learned along the way in marriage. So the last one is parenting. And this is probably one of the, it's interesting. Burke and I did a trip to Thailand in um, February to do this kind of training with some missionaries over there. And uh, I got with the moms, there were five moms who had all had young kids and we sat down, we had three hours together. And I was just praying, Lord, what are we going to talk about in three hours? So I asked him four questions. What's the best thing about being married? And they had to think, and then they answered. And I said, what's the hardest thing about being married? And they had to think, and then they answered. And I said, what's the best thing about being a mom? And they kind of had to think, and then they answered. And I said, what's the hardest thing about being a mom? And they rattled it off. <laughs> just that we spent the rest of the time talking about how hard it was being a mom. I've been there, I know, um, but you know what? Parenting is the greatest work. My mom would say, it's the greatest work you'll ever do with the least amount of training. And it is so true. It is so true. Um, I was over at a friend's house the other day. Her name's Andy, she's in our church and she's got three kids. Um, and she had a friend over, Sharon, and so I was talking, they had mops together. Do y'all have mops up here? Mothers of preschoolers. So they were in mops together. And so I said, Sharon, how'd you meet Andy? And she said, she explained. And then she said, but you know what? When I first met her, she told me she had three kids and she was raising world changers. Hmm. She said, that just blew me away. Cause you know what? I'm just hoping my kids graduate high school without being pregnant or getting someone pregnant. She and I just started laughing, but it really made me think, what's your perspective on parenting? What's the end goal? Because if you're just raising your kids, hoping they graduate from high school morally, 
that's the bar's pretty low. But if you're raising world changers, that changes the bar and it changes today and how you're going to parent and how the goals that you have set for your kids. You've got to keep the end in mind. What are you working for? Because it's so easy to get myopic and think, I'm just doing the same thing day after day. What kind of world changer am I making? But I think of what Paul said. He said, to say the same thing over and over again is not a hindrance. And that really helped me in my parenting to go, okay, I'm saying the same thing over and over again. I'm going to make sure it's not a hindrance. I guess it's not a hindrance. So, um, and I think another struggle I had in having kids is when, uh, before we had kids, we were just so into the gospel and, and out on campus and sharing and Burke was leading a home group. And, and then we had kids and this child, this big, I was home all the time. And I just was so hard to get out and do things. Now, of course, after a month or two, it's easier and easier, but the more you have, you know how hard that is. And so this is where Satan can get us so much you're not doing enough. You're not doing enough. You're just staying home with your kids. And that's what the world's telling us to. You're just staying home with your kids. No, that is where Satan just throws that lie. And we have got to be encouraged day after day knowing God has given us disciples. God has given us children to make world changers out. How is that going to look today? I often thought that I just needed to wear a referee shirt and a whistle and stay in the bathroom and just referee and spank the whole day because that's what I felt like I was doing. A few days, it was necessary, but we were raised a world changers and I didn't need to grow weary in doing good because that promise in Galatians 6 is you will reap if you do not give up. Bert mentioned this last night. Um, we've got to die to our comfort and die to our calendar. I don't know if you were like me, but man, I could list my way through the day and just hopefully check things off. And that's when I thought I had a good day is when I got it all checked off. I didn't wake up in the morning going, all right, um, let's see, Brian's gonna have a blowout diaper around 10 and we're not gonna make it to the park because John's gonna throw a temper tantrum as we're getting in the car. And then uh, Luke's gonna refuse to read. So we'll have to do, that's not on the schedule. You don't plan on that. But you have to die to your comfort and your calendar. Because Psalm 31, 15 says, our times are in his hands. Even that temper tantrum, that's at a time. God is not just working on your, or you're not just working on your children's character. God is working on your character. And that is building character. When you are able to patiently work through that diaper blowout or the temper tantrum. A struggle that I had so much was the verse about a harsh word stirs up anger. Okay, okay, I'm angry, I'm angry, I can't have a harsh word, I can't have a harsh word, because because it's gonna stir up his anger, but I'm angry, I'm angry, what do I do with this? And then one morning, I feel like the Lord just turned that around. No, you're angry because your child had the harsh word, and that stirred up your anger. Mm -hmm. And so when I finally, when I realized that it was really, a lightning, enlightening moment for me because I thought, okay, it's biblical. I'm angry because my child's a harsh word. Now I can go, I can start somewhere. Now I can really give this over to the Lord. And that really helped me a lot. Instead of condemning myself and condemning myself, I was able to put it before the Lord and go, okay, yeah, they are having a harsh word, but God, now you can work through that and help me. And that was a real breakthrough for my part. Burke really encouraged me too, because you know you tell your kids something and the next day they do it again. And in your mind, you're thinking, I told you this yesterday. I told you this this morning. Why are you doing that? I told you it five minutes ago. Why are you doing that? Are you not listening? And whoo, we just go from zero to 100 in our anger or in our emotions so quickly. And Burke really encouraged me to, to envision when I'm calm, Envision me staying calm in that circumstance. Envision being in the bathroom with them, disciplining them or talking with them, remaining calm in that circumstance. And the more I thought about it, then when that circumstance happened, I could be calm and I could stay in the spirit. And so that was a real help for me. Another real help was 1 Corinthians 13, when Paul said, 
uh, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I acted like a child. And I was like, well, praise the Lord. Paul did that. So my kids are okay because they're doing that too. <laughs> if they can be like Paul, I'm okay with that. So that was a real comfort to me to know that hey, Paul is just like my kids. My kids are just like Paul. So that was, that was huge. You know this, you're going to blow it. You're going to blow it. You're going to blow it in being a mom. One of my kids, when we have birthdays, um, we'll ask like, okay, what's a memory you have of that person? And so the last birthday I had, um, I asked the kids, because they're all gone, so they, would, they called in. Well, what memory do you have of me? And I'm thinking, oh, it's just going to be so warm and fuzzy. <laughs> so four of the six said the same memory. And it was, we had this big van, 11-seater van, and all six of the boys at this time took piano lessons from the same piano teacher. So from nine to 12 on Tuesdays was all piano lessons. So I would drop two of them off, take the other four, we'd go to the park or something, come back in an hour, pick two of them, drop two more off, pick them up, we'd go. Well, this particular day, um, I pulled up at noon, waited, it was 12.05, it was 12.10, and I was getting hangrier and hangrier. And so finally, the two boys tootle out, jump in the van, and I put it in. And so actually, before this, I'm sitting in the van, gr van grumbling, what's going on? Why is she not letting them out? What is going on? So finally, they get in the van, and I throw it in drive, and I speed off, and one of the boys says, Mom, Mrs. Wilson needs to talk to you. That was the teacher's name. I'm like, what does she need to talk to me about? And I throw it in reverse, and I back up, and I roll down the window, and she's at the end of her driveway, and I go, Hey, <laughs> and these kids are in the back rolling because they know how I was. I blew it. I just blew it. But we laugh about it now. So praise the Lord. A lot of times when you blow it, you just got to laugh about it. And because the grace of God's grace covers all. And just come back. And you know what? You want to teach your kids repentance. So model. Model it in front of to your husband. Model it to your kids. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I got I got angry. I shouldn't have gotten angry. I shouldn't have thrown that Lego. I don't know what, what you do when you get angry, but I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have spoken to you so harshly. I'm so sorry. They're seeing you model repentance. It's really going to help them to model repentance. Lay it all before the Lord. Pray without ceasing. I can't tell you how many times I ran upstairs during the day and just screamed into my pillow and cried out to the Lord. And um, yeah, it made me feel better, but God knows. <laughs> he knows. So one thing that Erica let me know is um, evangelism for when you have little kids. And that's really a struggle. But I have this sheet and I'm going to give it out. I'm going to give it to you. And you can make copies of it because I asked a lot of moms, like, how, how would you evangelize when your kids are little? And they gave me some really good uh, activities to do, some really good thoughts, um, as a, some as you go things when you're, when um, I know we, a lot of our moms, they, um, oh, I have one. I know I, I was talking to Catherine last night and she said, y'all have a template for testimony tracks. So Burke and I have our own person, our own married testimony track. And then I made one up for the COVID mm -hmm. that shares the gospel about mm -hmm. how are you feeling. And so this is super easy. We'll, you'll learn it tonight or tomorrow about asking people for prayer and how easy it is. And I don't know if it's just because we're in the South or if everyone's like this, but I have never asked someone how I can pray for them that they haven't given me something to pray for. Even if it's, Oh, just pray that the world stays healthy. People are so taken aback that you will be interested enough to ask them to pray. The cashier at the grocery store, that's the biggest one. Because you know, when you have young kids, you can't stop and give this gospel presentation for an hour and your kids are just going to stand there and pray. You got to be quick. But if you can ask to pray and then just give them, you know what? I know in that COVID, it's crazy, isn't it? This is something that's really helped me. 
you guys probably already do this, but I'm just going to reiterate that it is huge. And don't beat yourself up going, I was only able to give them a testimony track. There are so many people that have gotten saved through the gospel of grant. God, this is God's word. It won't return void without accomplishing what it was sent out to do. So be confident that confident of that but i have this sheet and i'm going to give it to you and you can just make some copies um, for ideas for mom uh kids in middle school and high school that's a big rub because you have more if you're homeschooling there is a lot more time you need to sit with your kids or concentrate on schooling you know when they're young they're in kindergarten they're in third grade or something you can skip a day of math or skip a day of something but once this is what i found and this is my opinion what does paul say this isn't me it's not of the lord um i spent I had to spend a lot of more time in schooling and so embrace it it's it's a season embrace it your kids need to learn this is going to be for the rest of their life they need to learn these things and so embrace that time uh, that you're with your middle schoolers and your high schoolers. Now we put our, we sent our kids to public high school. The two oldest went in 10th grade and then the four younger ones went in ninth grade. So we sent our kids to public high school and I was talking with Erica about this. The main reason was, was we wanted them to go out into the world and come back every night. And then we could talk about it. Okay. What'd you hear? What'd you see? But so many parents, when their kids get into high school, think, whew, I'm done. They can, they can drive, they're on their own, great, now I can do my thing. Boy, they need you just as much in high school in a whole different way than they did in, when they were little. They need you there because the world is grabbing them and wanting them to conform to the world and we can't be, let them be conformed to the world. We have to help them renew their mind. And so we've got to be involved. So we stayed involved with our kids. Um, we started off with having a Bible study in our home. And every Monday night, the kids could come over for Bible study. Now, I'll tell you a funny story. If I have time, I'll tell you a funny story. I think I have time. Um, the first night of the Bible study, we were just so excited. And we were going to have like four or five high school kids. And it was winter and it was cold. So we thought, well, we'll make it kind of nice in here and have a fire in our fireplace. And it'll be cozy and warm. And so Burke went out and he got wood and tried to start lighting the fire and it just wouldn't light and it wouldn't light. And so he went and he got some pine pine stuff because pine lights a lot quicker. And he put it on there and it, boy, it was great. It smelled like marijuana, like nothing else. <laughs> here we had these kids coming over from high school. Ah, uh, first Bible study. I know it smells like weed, but it's not really. So anyway, thank the Lord they kept coming. But anyway, we did that. We had that. Um, when our oldest son got to be a senior, juniors and seniors at their high school could go off campus for lunch. And so uh, Luke invited a couple of guys over for lunch. I said, I'll make BLTs. Just bring them over. We'll have BLTs for lunch. And so during their lunch, they started talking about how their mom doesn't cook. She works and da da da, and how great it is to have lunch made for you and all this stuff. So I thought, I told them, okay, next week, I'm going to do it again on Thursday. Just come here and I'll have lunch. Well, this time eight people came mm -hmm. for lunch. And I was like, you know what? We'll have lunch next Thursday. Just come for lunch. So Thursday lunch at the Wilson got to be a big thing in high school among the juniors and seniors. We would have 60 kids, even more in lunch. Now it was staggered. They had two lunches or sometimes three lunches. But we would have kids just come through. And that was a big thing I did during the week. And the kids that were at home being homeschooled would help out. And a couple of kids from church would help out, but they came through because we thought if they are comfortable in our home for a meal, maybe they'll be comfortable here in the gospel. Mm -hmm. And so it was a good opportunity just to die to myself, die to my calendar and die to my comfort and week after week cook this meal for these kids. And they loved it. They absolutely loved it. So uh, I'm not saying that's for everybody, but that was something we really did. Um, after well, I got involved in, all of our kids did sports. So I got involved in, it was uh, the athletic club at our high school. I volunteered at the office uh, once a week. So just staying involved and you get to know the parents and yeah, at the athletic games, you get to know parents and you're just able to um, 
strike up a conversation with them and just share the gospel with them and ask how you can pray for them. And, and the, the parents are going to know, especially that they know you have a Bible study, that you're a Christian. And little by little, as you give and you serve and you just get to know them and you're kind, is a great way to reach out in high school. Um, in all of this, I'm coming to the end. Um, in all of this, Burke and I have been resolute to stay partnered with each other because we knew one day our kids are going to leave. And I grew up in a family where my mom and dad grew apart. Mom, mom focused all on the kids. Even though she worked, she focused all on the kids. And she and my dad drifted apart so that when I left, they didn't divorce, but it was a very cold marriage. Mm -hmm. And I knew I did not want that to happen. To us and Bert knew that too. Bert came from it comes from a divorced family. So we were resolute in above all else, we are going to stay partnered together. And um and the kids have marveled and have told us, you know, again how how great that was and how many of their parent kids' parents were divorced. And yet they knew there was such security in our home because we were still partnered together. So I'm going to end in a story because I pray that what I shared, something that I shared today has helped and has encouraged you and that you can go home and, and you'll look at it and go, oh man, yes, this, this really helped. Um, when Burke drove for UPS, he was on, uh, he was sitting in his truck one day and this car in front of him, the driver, it was a stick shift car. And so the driver was trying to get it to go, but he kept stalling out, stalling out, stalling out. So this other car drove up and that driver rolled down his window and he yelled at this driver of his car. He said, push the gas in slowly and let the clutch out slowly. And the driver of this car said, I know, I know. And so this other man said, well, if you knew it, you'd do it. And that has just stuck with me so much. If you've heard something today and the Holy Spirit has spoken to you, don't let that fall by the wayside. If you know it, then do it. If you knew it, you would do it. So don't let that fall by the wayside. Um, I want to have a time for Q&A, but I also want to say this. Um, this is a shameless plug for a book that I wrote. It's a Bible study book. It's a 14 week Bible study and I've, I've used it with the women on campus, the ladies on campus, but I, I think you can use it really with anybody. I'd love for y'all to go through it, but it talks about um, giving your life to the Lord. What does it mean to regularly spend time with the Lord, taking your thoughts captive, keeping your conversations God glorifying, sexual purity, how do, how do you handle anxiety and worry? And it goes through, you do the Bible study on your own during the week, you answer the questions, and then once a week, it's the same format. And this is the pattern that you're going to learn. We're going to learn tonight or tomorrow. We call it the pattern of care. And you do it the same every time so that a new believer or an unbeliever can do this. It's so simple how to lead a Bible study because that's what we want to do in raising disciples is we want them to lead and pass it off to them. And so every topic, the, what you learn in the Bible lesson is a woman from the Bible that exemplifies that topic. And so you read about her, you reread the, you re retell the story. So you're getting these girls to learn about women in the Bible, maybe some you haven't heard of, or some that are kind of weird and you don't know why they're in there. Um, so they're in here. And then you set goals, how you're going to apply it in your life. Uh, you have an opportunity to put a verse down for you to memorize. So Lord willing, by the end, you've memorized 14 verses. You've learned about 14 women in the Bible. You've been able to pass on how so someone else can lead a Bible study. And every week you, you make goals and you keep each other accountable. And there's a time to go, you make a goal to go out sharing with your discovery Bible study leader. So by the end of that time, Lord willing, you've got some pretty solid disciples who are able to pass this on to other people. So it's on Amazon. If you put Barbara Wilson Grow in there, you should be able to come up with it. But it's pink with a sunflower. Is that a new cover? Yeah, it I, is. I think we, we've done that before. Yeah, I took the old one okay. and I hated it. Okay. And I revamped the whole thing.
So this is the second edition, but the first edition is so okay. not good. Anyway, um, so yeah, if you have the first edition, throw it out because this one's way better. Um, all right, well, if there's no questions, I don't know, does anyone have any thoughts or ideas or encouraging verses? If you have any of those encouraging verses that you want to share. Say that again. I did. Okay, wait a minute. Hold on. Jot your comfort and your calendar. It's in here. Psalm somewhere. 3115. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Psalm 3115. Yeah, that's it. Psalm 3115. And if you have anything to add, like, oh, you kind of, I, this is something that I think would even help. Please, this is not the all end all. If there's something else you want to add to this, please. Are there any any Zoom women that want to ask a question? Just put it out there. And if not, that's fine. I just don't feel want free to, to use the chat too, ladies. If you don't want to speak up, there's the chat button. I just don't want to leave with anything unanswered. What were, what would be some of your tips in light of COVID? And you know, maybe people's different comfort levels and you know, like any tips or practical advice that you in respect in respect to maybe like having small children, you know, like kind of Well, uh, I want to get together. Yes. You know, like, yeah. Parks are closed. It can't be healthy. You know, like, yes. And our, yeah, our parks are closed. Yeah. Um, I think in our church, a lot of the parents have just gotten together in their home and the kids have come over. So they've done more home things than being able to really get out. Um, but I tell you, some of, I know one family, they have six kids and they, go for a bike ride or walk around the block every day. And they have really gotten to talk to a lot of people that way. They've just made sure that their kids get out. And I think that's one thing we've seen with the COVID that I've really appreciated is we've slowed down, we've just slowed down. And these moms that have had their kids in uh, this and this and this and this, and it's all closed. It's really kind of been a blessing of just being able to be home with the kids. And the, and the dad's home too. And so, um, so I think they've really taken advantage of that is just really focusing and having to be creative and doing more fun things at home. But, but those that have not been so COVID quarantined have, uh, have gotten together in each other's homes. So I think in North Carolina, things are starting to kind of open up a little bit. Um, where mask is a mandatory whenever you go out. I don't know if kids wear masks. I don't know that I've seen little kids wear masks, but they're mandatory for going out. So, yeah. Well, let me pray and we can end. And Lord willing, we're ending early. So if anyone's got a kid waking up, they can go tend to their child. So Lord, we uh, thank you so much for this time. Thank you, God, that your word won't return void without accomplishing what it was sent out to do. And there were nuggets of verses in here. I pray that these would fall on hungry hearts and hungry ears. Lord, speak to each one of us. God, it could be just a small tweak that we need to do, or it could be something big that we need to uh, change. But Lord, let us be those women who hunger for you to take initiative with you, take initiative with our husbands, love on those kids, and really train them and disciple them just as you would want them to be. We praise you for all that you're doing. Thank you for the men in our lives, Lord. Uh, they are so such treasures. Thank you for the gifts of our children. Lord, let us continue to look at them that way, but look at you most important. And I just praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 I had one more thing I was going to say. I don't remember. Okay. Good. Well, thanks, y'all. Thank Absolutely. This was such a treat. I really appreciate y'all letting me come. And like I said,
said, I probably didn't share anything new. It's just we all need that shot in the arm sometimes, don't we? Yeah. And just knowing that you're okay. You know, I think of in First uh, Peter, it talks about know that the same, the sufferings, your sufferings are the same as everyone else in the world. So the moms all over the world are doing going through the same thing you're going through. I, I really appreciated the um, drop the ball. Yeah. Mm. I think I have a, there's some controlling things in my personality. Yeah. So the dropping the ball was really good for me to hear. Good, good. And then not, and that was going to be my question was, do I then save the day and pick it up? And to not, I never really thought about that. So, so, yeah. so I could step on people's toes with this and y'all push back if I'm wrong. I think our desire to control is a pride thing. It hits at the heart of pride because we think we have a better idea than God we want to control it we don't want to let him control it and so we can easily laugh it off and say i'm such a control freak <laughs> well it's really a pride thing that we want to be in control and you've got kids you know that that is hard when you want to be in control because they want to be in control don't they and so not that you want to give in to their control because you're the mom you need to be the mom but um with our husbands we are called to, I love the Amplified about submitting and it says adapt. Mm -hmm. That's our job is to adapt to our husbands and they're gonna fail. And often I think my husband gives me so much grace that I don't deserve, can I not do the same for him and let him fail and, um, and just let it go. Because in the end, I love this. There's nothing that we can, what, what is it? There's we're going to lose everything in our life except the love of Jesus. There is nothing we're going to take with us but the love of Jesus. Can I walk in the love of Jesus and have that perspective? Does that make sense? But try it. You know what? Test the Lord and say, I'm not going to pick that ball up and I'm going to see what you do and see how it turns out. <laughs> <laughs> and see if it works better yeah yeah any other thoughts i thought that was a great that's a great question or a great comment yeah i was thinking your covid um track can we adapt this to use ourselves oh or absolutely it, or is it completely personal can you I, repeat that yeah what you repeat? oh what she just said she wants the covid track can you adapt it absolutely you can have it i love and, it um, and take it oh and i need to give you the mom's thing too um, yes, please take it and use it. And you could probably make it better. I did it really quickly and I haven't read over it in a little while. So I might look at it and go, ooh, it needs to be better. But it does have the gospel in it. So that's really a, that's what we need. Just the gospel in it. So yes, take it. And here's the mom thing. And here's the COVID. Thank you. And you can have it and keep it. Absolutely. All right, so I'm going to step down from here so all the moms can unzoom and if they're still on. Thank you so much, Barbara. You. Oh, you're welcome. You. Absolutely. This is such a treat. I love doing this. So, um, yeah. I have failed many times and I don't mind. 